Tom Tumbleson, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Morning, Rob. Pleasure's mine. No, thank you for coming on, mate. I really do appreciate it. So before we get into the meat of the conversation, which is going to be around speed training, testing, game speed, all stuff that people out there are mad for right now, would you mind just giving us a bit of a bio on you? Yes. So um, currently I'm Senior Strength and Conditioning Coach with England Rugby. I've been with the union in various guises since 2014. Um, prior to that, I was at the um, working in Super Rugby with the New South Wales Waratahs um, um, for a good period. Got to Australia 2009 when I started there. I was, I was playing there, working at Sydney University, and then I, I managed to snag a role at Waratahs. Had a good stint there, which got me um, into the the English team 2014. Prior to that, I was a I was a wannabe player um, with knowing in the back. Were of- you any good, Tom? Must have been all right. Um, I, well, no, I, I yeah played all right. Played at a good level. Most of my um my rugby was sort of semi professional in the championship in England, um, and also shoot shield in Australia, which is a really good standard. It's kind of the level below Super Rugby. I played England sevens for a couple of tournaments. Um, so yeah, I mean, good enough to good enough to know. I think you're playing this. I think you're playing it down, Tom. Oh mate, I actually played on the weekend um, in alumni. And I was disgusted with myself. Like all these little 20 year old whippets zipping around the 40 year old me. Um, I could have been better, mate, which is one of the reasons I was a coach. I came, became a coach because I was pretty dissatisfied with how you were looked after back then. And the pursuit of um, trying to be better led you to do your own investigation and research and do your own thing. So that kind of ball got rolling as to think, oh, maybe I should do that as a career because. I'm probably better at that than the, you know. But I'm better at that than the people I'm, I'm trying to play with. So um, that's actually what fueled the passion, really. That search. We didn't get a lot of that provision when I was when I was in the academy or even coming through the systems. Not like you get now. And I, I'd I'd have loved that. I'd love the sort of support you get now. But you know, strength and conditioning wasn't a problem for me. I was I was a pretty good athlete. But and that's where my bias is laid. I I needed to go elsewhere. I need to spend time with a psychologist and a bloody skills 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 coach more often tackle coach so how did you get into the england setup what was who was who was in charge at the time how what was that transition into the england setup like stuart lancaster and it was i just it was real a real formal process um they offered they advertised on sport england and i just went through the normal process so there was no sort of job for the boys thing it was a, a r- rigorous process did loads of interviews um, I was in Australia at the time, and we just won Super Rugby. So perhaps the appeal there was that an English an English player could just had an experience like that in Australia. We had a really good team, plenty of Wallabies. It was Michael Checker's regime, and it was a it was a good institution. So maybe that was the appeal. That must have been the appeal. It wasn't the haircut, but um, that was that was it really. I mean, I knew a couple of people in the system, so there was a link there. But yeah, just went through the pathway. And bring it more to the present day, just back from the World Cup, which seems to, like I said to you before, seems to have gone on for forever. Probably seems more so for you, who's who's been in the thick of it. From the outside and press-related news over-delivered, what was the experience like? It was it was um there was a bit of pressure going into it before we got to France because we were, our form was off, and we were pushing the lads hard, and they weren't. They didn't express themselves as perhaps as well as they could in the summer because for various reasons we were we were still forming, we were training real hard. We get to, we got to France. Our first game against Argentina was a real that was an England game, an England performance. That all of the lads, all of the the old stages and the and the young blokes really performed. And from then on, we had a lot of momentum and it was a real enjoyable experience. You kind of felt like you know we're in it now. The boys have got the you know the bit between their teeth. We're starting some kind of tapering process. Their energy's coming back, and we're starting to, you know, bear the fruits of our labour. And they were they were getting more cohesive each game, and it was, you know, France itself was a great experience. In when you're there, is, are, are you very much in a management, not management of people and staff, but in managing the player mode? Because you have a week between each game, don't you? 
So in that week, how much do you actually get done, which is the core reason you're there as a senior S&C coach, or are you just managing guys for the next game to try to get them there? Well, I think in previous regimes, it's probably been like a 24-7 experience where you're round the clock supporting them. This this tournament was a bit more work, like I had more like a work and home life balance. We weren't at home, but we're home from home. So we go to the facility, we'll do all of our work there. Then we'll come home and there'll be no meetings or any extra stuff there, apart from the medics who might be treating. But you'd get into your casual clothes and then you'd, you'd, you'd get your head away from the game, which is what you have to do if you're going to be in camp for that long. And it was, it's a smart way to do it because it, it allows you to refill the batteries in the evenings. And make sure that when you're off days, you, you generally have off days. So it, well, it's not as all-consuming as perhaps other tournaments have been. We're in really good venues where there's plenty to do. Like nearly, there must be about forty to fifty of us who've now got an obsession with paddle tennis that we can't get rid of because there was all there, there's courts there everywhere, and everyone's obsessed with that now. And um, family were close by, so they were they were in cl- um, close proximity. So there was a good good blend and balance. But the fact that they're in camp means that if you need to do extra stuff, you can, and it's there. And a lot of lads do. If, they, if we're next to a gym facility, they're, they're doing more bits and bobs. You, you can help them if you need to. So you've got that flexibility, but I think the blend would, that we got right there was pretty good. So then there's a, quite a contrast from the, the last tournament. In terms of the, the player experience, and this, your experience, obviously, but the, in terms of the player experience, how was, did that go down? Because I'm guessing it's quite a contrast, like I say, or like you said. Yeah, well, I mean, the setting was obviously very different in being in Japan, where it's you're not you're not quite as accessible. Like if when we were in Miyazaki four years ago, there's not much you can't really get out. It's a beautiful place, but there's not much to do outside of the, the hotel. Whereas France, like I said, we're in the two K, and that's like a sports town. There's places to eat and bikes and good shops and sports everywhere. It was it was bloody good. So. It was a different experience, location, location, location. It, it, it very much it was dependent on that. Class. What's expectation? I know it's a long time away. What is expectation as you kind of move forward into the next four years? Well, we've had three retirements um, after the last game and everyone else looks, looks like they're still in it. And... We've got some really good young lads like Theo, Dan, and Henry Arundel, like some real, really good players that are going to just get better and better. And we've got a, we've got that middle tier of player that's got like 10, 20 caps that will really start to you know really feel like they got their groove with international rugby as they get to like 40, 50 cap internationals. So it's really encouraging. And um, even just watching the Premiership this weekend, like I watched four games, I think, and. There's like, oh, well, that player's pretty good. He's he's becoming good. And this guy here, like, wow, he had a real good game. And these guys are all 21, 22 years old. So personally, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um, there's some guys that can do some really good stuff going forward, I'm sure of it, yeah. Happy days. Right, mate. Crux of the conversation, speed testing and training. Let's 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 dive in. So one of the presentations at the, the March conference, of the Sports with Speed conference in March, was Jonas Dodu. I know he's been involved with with you guys quite a bit over the over the years. And one thing that he presented on was using sprinting as a movement screen. And I wanted to get your take on implementing that day to day, week to week, month to month with a large group and what this actually looks like in practice. Would you be able to give us your view of of that question and and, and take it as far as you want and we'll we'll dive in um probably multiple times off the back of that. Yeah, so we we do use um, sprinting as a movement screen as thoroughly as we can. Doing it as a group is difficult, but so what we we'll tend to do is identify players at the, the beginning of each campaign or week to week that will use that will have eyes on and use the the, uh, the sprinting movement screen for. And it, and it's gonna it looks a little bit like this. So if we've got a player that's coming in with a chronic um, injury or a niggle that, that we feel that sprinting can help us identify any fluctuations in their in their daily state or if we've got someone that has had a let's just say a limited return to play process and we want we need to be quite diligent diligent on them and how they're preparing and ready to play we'll use the speed warm-up 
as a movement screen, but a lot of it's the preparatory work done before the speed session starts. So let's say, for example, in our facility, we've got a 3G and we've got some tumble matting and quite a big area. The lads, before we start training, they will start doing their movement prep and they'll be doing drills and they'll be doing dynamics and they will, they'll be getting up to doing almost like a, a scissor bleed or a dribble bleed indoors before they go outside. And we'll, we'll have staff on hand like myself and the medics who are pretty good these days with running mechanics. They, they can pick things up. They've got a good coaching eye. We'll basically be on spot. I very much like the, the, the performance therapy concept that, that Dan Paff and Altis use. We'll be looking at them to see if any drills that they normally perform, if anything's sticking out like a sore thumb, or if players feeding back to us that things aren't quite right. Like the players are pretty good now. Like if someone's got a, a locked hip or their foot's not feeling right or, or their shoulder's bunged, and we'll, either they or we will chat to them each rep and just pick up, pick up on it. Now, this might be five or six players. Not everyone is doing this. Some lads just do do their work. They've been playing for weeks. They do their work and they leave. But in the event that something does stick out, we're all on hand. And let's just say something's been picked up. There's all these things in this space that they can use. They can, whether that be therapists on hand, whether it be all of the literary of mobility or self myofascial release techniques that we've got at hand, whether it be sticks, rollers, balls, weights, um, RPR, massage guns, bands, all the things that kind of self-calibrate that allow you to go back in, check and retest to see how they're moving. We've got staff on hand as well. So it's, it's quite an organic process and it's quite unique to each player, depending on our understanding of them, their history and their interaction with us as well. It's, it sounds... It's, it sounds like it's like a Formula One pit stop, but it's a bit more it's a bit more fluid than that. So then they go out on the field, and then we might do our actual speed prep, our formalized speed prep, which could range anything from twenty five minutes in a World Cup camp to four minutes, if if the lads have been well prepared because they're pretty good these days. They get well prepared. Like you could argue, a lot of lads don't even need a speed prep. They they get they're so well versed at preparing themselves to be up and running. You just need a primer or some kind of activation moment. If that's the case, we'll tend to have one medic um, behind the boys. So they've got a frontal plane view and I'll tend to stand on the side so they've got sagittal plane view. And I'll just look at the drills that the lads do every single day to see if anything's, any aberrations are sticking out like a, like dog's balls. And they might just go one after the other. I'm not, I'm not so skilled that I can look at everyone sprinting maximally. 14 lads at once and go bang, bang, bang. I just can't, I'm, I'm not down path. I can't do that, but I can do it with a scissor bleed. I can do it with a dribble bleed. And if I'm looking at four people instead of 14 to see if any of the work we've done 15 minutes before or the day before, if anything is sticking out. So I tend to look at three drills and so does the med, um, so does um, our medical team behind and we'll see if anything is really going out of its bandwidth. And you just, you'll see me, I'm squinting like this to see if what kind of shapes and manoeuvres and patterns are not quite like they used to be. The reality is we don't have a lot of time to intervene right there. A lot of that stuff should be done indoors when you've got time, because we don't have meetings that go straight into the field. There's, there's time to prep beforehand. But if something's really is sticking out, then you do have an opportunity to talk to the coach and go, this guy's not quite ready yet. We need a, he needs a bit more treatment. He needs a little bit more care here, TLC. Can we? Can you give them five minutes? And those and those guys are normally sweet with that because they know we've been thorough beforehand. It's not like they walked in with a coffee. They've tried to warm up and they weren't they weren't right. They've done their due diligence beforehand. If something's still not right, it means you just you're just being smart. So that's that's pretty much the process, Rob. It's like I said, it's very bespoke to individuals. It's not on mass, and we'll pinpoint these people before the session, who we're going to look at and who we're going to keep eye on. And they tend to be case studies that start at the beginning of each, each campaign. You mentioned those three drills. You may have said it already. So if you have apologies, I was probably scribbling some notes down. What are the three drills that you typically use? So some kind of pogo or, or jump rudiment. That might be a single leg or a bilateral pogo, whether it be forward to back, sideways, diagonal. And we're looking at there's different, there's different like lists we've got there with what we look out for on each drill. So, for example, with pogos, you're hiking at the hip. Are you able to compress enough and dorsiflex? Or are you just trying to pull yourself off the ground? What's, what are you like left to right? If we know that someone's got a, 
a left or right issue where maybe they're, they're guarding one side. What are the arms doing in that situation? Are they sitting back? What's their height like? Do they look flat on the ground? Like how much are they yielding? Those types of things that, again, we've very much been influenced by um, Dan Pfaff on that one. I'm just going to jump in, Tom. So do you have a a standardised list that you and the other staff would kind of check off? Or is that very... Okay, perfect. We've yeah. got there now. We've got there yeah. now. But it used to be just like, oh, shit, what looks bad? But now we've yeah, got, okay. we've got, we do have a checklist for the drills now. And yeah. those ones I've just mentioned there. But um, let's just say if we were talking about scissors, uh, like a scissor bleed, that might be like the ability to dorsiflex when, when they've hit their sort of their... They block their thigh in front of their body. If let's just say that that's looking different to the normal and they're plantar flex and they don't have that mobility and that sort of uh, posterior posterior sling, hey, hey, this guy's looking a little bit restricted here. We're running fast today. We might need a little bit more help here. And then might go to a medic or even me if I can help. It's just one of those things. It's just a landmark that you can use as a reference for that person that stays consistent. And if it goes well outside of that like standard deviation, that subjective standard deviation, then you know this doesn't look quite right here. But other examples would be um, the, the head axis in a dribble, in a in a scissor bleed. Are they sitting back? Are they over rotating as they hit the ground? What the what the contact point on the floor when they do the scissors? The speed across the ground? Are they able to displace vertically as they do them? If we're doing a straight leg scissor bound, are they pushing through the floor if they're doing a bent knee scissor bound? I mean, it, that's that's got a checklist as well as the dribbles, and then finally, um, sorry, the scissors. But then we've got the same for the dribbles, and then. If we really know our lads well, some of those points are more specific to some players than others. Like we know one player, if he can't dorsiflex when he when he does a scissor bleed, he's got some restrictions posteriorly. We know that's a big thing for that person. That's a flag for that person. And I'm not. I'm not. It's not like we sit down there with a clipboard checking it all off. It's just something I know. This guy now. I've been. I've been with him for five or six years. This is a, something we look out for. And then you see him run past doing scissors, and you go, Yeah, he looks. He looks on today. And, it, and it's, it's a feel thing. Like it's not, it's not really, really clinical. But with, like I said, with um, myself and Bob Stewart, who's the head of medical, we've been with the lads for seven, eight years now, and we kind of know what their what their alerts are. And then uh, our challenge now is when a new lad comes in in four weeks, what's his alert going to be? And it takes time to to understand that. That's where you've got to try and build that relationship really, really quickly. And any intel you can get from the clubs prior to them coming in, that's really important as well. This this area, I think, and this from my experience and, and speaking to other people, this kind of topic, especially when either you talk about it or Jonas talks about it or Alan Murdoch or whoever, is probably quite daunting for a younger coach to go, okay, I'm going to put on this, I'm going to put on this particular drill, even if it's four athletes. They're moving pretty quick, even in these drills versus, you know, max velocity sprinting. To identify these points that you're going to, you know, action, that doesn't look right. Like that, that's that's quite a daunting task. From your experience and starting this process, what advice would you give younger coaches or less experienced coaches to start off going through this and getting to the point where they're they're developing and they not a checklist, not going down and 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 doing that, but in the head creating that process. Yeah, it is, it is Rob. Like and the reality is, you've got to know the body really, really well, and you've got to be really on top of your biomechanics. So there's a fair bit of study required on this one. And I, again, I was, I keep on saying um, Dan Pfaff, but I was very much influenced by his technical model. And without that, I would have just been scratching around in the dark. So you need to you need to have an idea about what is ideal, so you know what is un you know what isn't ideal. But my advice would be is just start real simple. And have just start on a real basic layer and pick something for each player that you know you can use as a monitoring tool, much much like your musculoskeletal screens in the morning, whether you're doing a, a groin squeeze or a knee to wall. What's that what that one thing that you look out for that player that you know is off, then you need to you need you need to do something about it, as opposed to trying to cover all of these different sort of kinematic landmarks for all the players, all running fast. That will that will never happen. I just, I kind of had three levels. Like I just, like I said, I squint my eyes and just look at the basic rhythm of the player and see if anything's off. And then if everything's reet or everything's not, the second layer will sort of kind of get the input from behind about if there's anything going on left v right. 
and quite often there sometimes we have film film in the moment if we've got time right there's some tablets out there or or even a, an iphone on a tripod and that gives us a little bit more input if someone's listing or if someone's rotating funny or the recovery pathway is not quite right on one side when it when it normally is and that's on the, that's in the moment and then the third layer is probably retrospective after training we then go and look back at it and we look at the video ourselves and really have a big big deep dive if let's just say someone had to keep getting treatment during training or he felt off we'll try and use a retrospective process to try and then make the next day better and try and tweak what we did in the prep phase but my advice for people starting out is just starting that real basic layer just look at a general rhythm and just pick some one thing for each person not each person just pick one thing for maybe a couple of your bell cows who are your case studies that you really need to be eyes on and not try and do too much and then just dive into kinematics and kinograms and be obsessed with looking at footage and test your ability to look at things in real time well, i mean i when i watch um rugby now i stop i stop the tv and if someone's running a try and i'll almost just use that as an opportunity to look at running mechanics and see if i can pick things up send it around to my mate um, or anyone in my network and go, what do you think about this? I don't even know the player. The player doesn't know us, but we're just having a bit of a, a nose off with regards to seeing how, how we can test our ability to pick up on things. It's practice. It really is. And you start to see things after a while. And um, people, how did you see that? I go, I don't know. You just kind of saw it. But you just saw the rhythm and the shape and you, you know what you're looking out for in the first place. And I'm not an expert. I, I really am not. There was much more proficient people at it than me. But you do start to th- see things. Do you use any tech in this process? In this process, or have you used any tech in this process? Yeah, yeah. So, um, if we've got if we've got the tablet on and we look at someone videoing, if we video an acceleration or a top speed run from behind or side, we'll use Huddle, which is which has got a really really easy tracking system. Like you can design kinograms really easily. You can notate them with angles and you know landmark different joint positions. That's a real real easy bit of tech for us. Huddle, which used to be, um, I can't think what it used to be now, but um, that, that's the easiest one for us. Dark, dark fish back in the day. I know you mentioned, and I'm sorry to dumb this down even further and, and eke more out for these kind of younger coaches who are daunted by this process. Is the one particular thing that may be f- useful for these coaches to grab onto and, and use as that one thing? Like what drill would you recommend and what would you ident- try to identify to be that first kind of step into this process? I'd pick like the, the drills that we use there, those um, pogos or rudiments, the scissors and the dribbles are things that they're going to do every single day that you're not just going to dip in and out of. Like I have been guilty in the past of doing all these crazy drills and changing them all the time, differential learning, but there was nothing stable to... Um, hook onto and assess day to day. Recently now, I'm probably boring the players a little bit in trying to keep that warm up period pretty stable. So the warm up looks pretty similar. How we get into top speed and what we're doing there might change. They might, it's either going to be a wicket or a fly or, or, or a hollow run of some description, but the actual drills are very, very consistent. Might mix and match the sequence and how they're doing and, and sort of work to rest and in the zones that they do them in, but it's always a pogo, a dribble and a scissor. And pick something, really get good at understanding what the mechanics should that be. And there's plenty of content online about what kind of technical models fit the things you're looking for. There's loads on there, like the educational platforms now that Altis and whatnot are doing is vast. So you, you can and you can know that pretty, pretty easily with a minimal cost. So just pick something super simple and do it daily so you can practice it every single day. Like exactly like you would do like an FMS or some other kind of movement screen. Is that lack of or change from a very variable warm up and variable training methods to a more stable, solid ground? Is that one of the biggest transitions that you've had in this area over the last, you know, using 2014 and your start your England career? Yeah, yeah, because I was probably a bit too conscious of making them fun and energetic. You know, when I first joined, I wanted to, I wanted people to think I was the energy giver and all this lot. And there's definitely merit for that, whether it be in the weight room or on the field. But you can still do that with, with having, you can still do that while maintaining some stability about the things you want to screen. 
And because we're not out on the field long to do that period, it might be 10 minutes, like I said, there's still time for other stuff. Like as soon as they go to the get ball in their hands, we can, we can introduce some fun and joy and some ga- game of, gamify the final stage of the warm up. But that's still that, those drills I mentioned, they can still be stable. You might not even do them on the field. You might do them indoors. We've got a big, big area and that's being done off the grid. It's not being done as a formal part of training. So I, th- I think in recent times, I've definitely been more conscious about being a disciplined about keeping hold of some of the things that I know can give me a good representation of the lads day to day and not worrying too much about being like the, the circus jester that's just about energy. You need, you need a blend, don't you? Is that, is that the case in the weight room as well in terms of your programming there? Yeah, yeah. We um we won't use the movement screen, but we'll use a lot of fun primers. Like we we're big into Sorry mate, I, I meant like the, the kind of consistent things that rather than jumping around to make things entertaining and, and keep the guys interested, but actually dialing it down to some core things that remain pretty stable throughout the program. Just wondered if that kind of translates to the I think weight room as well. Weight room's a little bit different because we tend to do the um, lift in the afternoon. So they've done their morning work. They might have had a nap and they're coming in at that time of the day where they might be sort of coming down. So we'll we'll do some we'll use some primers there. They could be specific with a ball. They could be complete fuckery. Like it might be killer with a basketball or football tennis or red ass or so, something really just purely about energy. And then we'll come in the come, come in the gym. And then they're ripping in straight away. Like we might have a warm up planned for the gym, and like, no, these guys are ready to rip in. Let's just go. And then we'll just spend spend longer on the initial build up sets to their first lift. It's, it's probably a little bit different because it's not so. They're not under so much pressure in the afternoon when they're lifting the gym. They're, they're a little bit more relaxed, but they might be a little bit dopey. So that's quite, is it a bit more just about energy giving in that one and sparking them back up. So they're walking in the gym. They've had a right laugh. The energy's insane, and then and then we're into it. What's been the biggest thing that you've added or removed from you? On this, this is going back to the speed side. Added or removed in the last year since two thousand fourteen. Well, one of them would be, definitely be the interventions of that therapeutic input um, in our version of perform, performance therapy. That the inclusion of the medics in that in that process. The stability of the warm up in the prep in the prep phase, like I mentioned, with those those kind of indicator drills that I mentioned, the emphasis and the the focus on the players being really really diligent with their individual prep time, as opposed to the process of us warming them up. Like they very much they very much need to be eighty percent before we start putting our hands on them, and they're very very good at that now. Not trying to, I think I did mention it, not trying to muck about too much with variety and fun and and social media speed drills that look good, that you might get sent by a player going, look at that, what's that do? Being a bit more, like I said, deliberate with your warm up. Keeping the main thing the main thing, Rob. Like in the past, I've probably been guilty of doing everything but running fast, maybe because of, there was a bit of fear in there, or maybe because I just thought training would look after it, it, it would get covered. So making sure they actually are running fast. Like I think I can remember some uh, times in um, 2015 where I, was, I didn't even run fast in speed today. We just did everything but, and I don't even know why. I just, it was just one of those things where it was some bizarrely, I just, I mislaid it. It didn't happen. I just thought it was going to happen naturally. So being more constructive with drill design, so things implicitly happen naturally and kind of hard not to happen. And when I'm talking about getting to ninety percent on a on a heavy day, that's what I'm talking about. Getting up and running properly so they are ready to go. If, if the first action in the drill is a is a massive kick chase, they're ready for it. They're not using training to get ready. They see they're in. Coaches will not tolerate someone not being ready for that first action, and neither should they. Um, other things, Rob, well, just creating the environment that speed is really bloody important. It's a it's a premium here. It's a part of it's a prerequisite for all players. Like there isn't a player whose role in the game model doesn't depend in some kind of speed or movement, whether that be agility, evasion, acceleration, or top speed, maneuverability. Marketing the hell out of that, like us, some kind of you know car salesman, making that important. Like How have you done that, Tom? How have you done the marketing side of that? So I'm going to 
I, 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 if I name drop a lot, Rob, it's not because I'm um, trying to show uh, my network. It's just because I'd like to refer- tell people, you know, reference the people that have been influenced to me because I think that's important. Tony Holler's concept of record, rank, and publish. That's that's worked great for us. Our lads are extremely competitive, and if you put if you rank them in their speed scores or, or velocities in the gym or any other, any you know what any metric any parameter at all they go bloody hard on the back of that. How can I get this better? What do I need to do here? They're so competitive these lads. That's that works instantly. But ultimately, the lads want to do play well and they want to be international rugby players and excel and. When you work back from the game, like I just said, good luck being a success if you can't move, if you can't accelerate, get off the line and hit, if you can't chase kicks, if you can't finish tries, if you can't chase people down, if you if you can't pull away from defenders when you need to. So it's it's you know speed's one of those easy things, Rob. It's 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 quite hard to argue with a lot of people, whereas some people might resist the need to be you know thinking they need to have a bigger work capacity. In, in various formats, everyone like who who could argue that speed's important? A lot of people might argue that they can't train it; it's not going to help them. But even if you use it from a, um, a speed warm up in an, on an acute level, it's going to get you ready for the, what's happening in ten minutes' time. You do that well ten times in a in a Six Nations campaign. Guys are feeling pretty good by the end of it, all being well if they're healthy. So, you know, we use a bit of theatre as well, Rob. Like. We have to make sure there's loads of screens available in the gym with all the drills up and there's a video loop going on. So it's kind of easy just to nudge them into the right direction. We celebrate it in, in any of our debriefs or team meetings. Moments where we wanted them to express their physical abilities and they've done it. So with that celebrated, we used to do an award called the, the Running Back Award, where if a player really expressed themselves in, in a way that we've been encouraging them to, um, and they did, they'd get a um, a running back T-shirt. Let's just say um, we had a, a guy that we really liked, Christian McCaffrey. We ended up giving him a, a McCaffrey T-shirt and he got the running back award that week. And then the next week, we'd look for moments where guys have done the things that we've asked them to to do and back themselves and use the skills that they've started to develop in camp. And that was, then, um, you know, one guy got a Mark Ingram T-shirt and because he was kind of, he fitted that Mark Ingram style of running and pace and explosion. So... That was that type of thing, like hamming it up, making it important. You mentioned there about players coming to you and saying, I've seen this drill on Instagram or Twitter or something. Like, can we get, have you ever been sucked into that at certain times, either whether it's via a player or via someone that, you know, you look up to and you want to get drag in what they're doing? Like, have you ever been influenced that by that? And it's been, you've regretted it? Or on the flip side, have you thought, oh, I'm, Delighted I did that. That's, that was a really good choice to include that. Yeah, I have done with Jules, Rob. Like, you know, when the, um, when like the Franz Bosch influence was re- really hitting its peak a few years ago, guys were doing stuff with water bags and bands, or, you know, perturbing all these movements. I started doing that because a lot of those people in that network have consulted with us. And so we've put this, this stuff in. There was, there's been times when I've gone over the top with it. And like I said before, I stopped making the main thing the main thing, which was executing our movement screens really well and running fast. And it got to a period where it was like, well, actually, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing here. They're not running fast in the warm up. They're drilling like crap because they're holding a 15 kilo plate. They're not, it's, we are moving away from what the whole point of this stuff was. But it, it became fever pitch, didn't it? Everyone was doing it. And you hear all these anecdotes about all these amazing results. You start getting seduced into it, even though you probably feel like you're doing a good job anyway. So that's definitely, I fell into that trap. Um, instances where I've looked at social media and it has worked. Some of the game speed drills now, they're, they're everywhere, aren't they? Like um, Dan just put some in, in your latest Sportsmith article um, about game speed. And look, there's some great ideas there. Al Murdoch's got ideas coming out of his ass. Like they come up a lot. And I like to go to other worlds to see it, like especially American football or soccer. And there's been times when I've taken a drill from there and it's gone great guns. It's gone brilliantly. There's times when I've done it and it's gone down like a fart in a lift. It's been terrible. And I've like literally had to apologise. Fuck. I just caveat I just caveat it at the beginning. This could be a massive fuck up, boys. Let's just see what happens here. And if it goes up like that, I've just I've nullified the effect, haven't I? But um 
I, I think now you just, you do dish all. Like, I like ideas. I look at it and go, can this work? What's the point of this? It looks good. Is it good? You know, is it, does it def- defy our context? I veto it pretty hard these days. I don't want to get stuck into that trap. When you mentioned about the, the lads getting to, I think you mentioned 80%, like get it to us at 80% so we can do our thing. How have you implemented that to make sure that they do take ownership of that first 80% of their prep? What does that look like? Um, I'm just yeah, interested in that whole process. Yeah. So let's just say you've got someone like a Johnny May. He, he You weren't telling him what to do. He knows exactly what to do. He's a student already. I'll learn more for him than he learns from me. There's, you might have a young lad that's come in who's a speedster. Um, the first time he trains, you'll watch him, see what's going on here. And you'll, you'll, give him a, you'll tell him your expectations are that you need to be ready at 80%. You need to get ready here. There's a certain amount on you to get ready here. And you watch him do it. And if he starts training well and that routine works for him, I'm not going to mess around with that. If I think for some reason it should be more thorough. If someone's struggling and they've not started well, we'll sit down and we'll debrief this and we'll discuss what's worked for him in the past, what our expectations are of him and how ready he needs to be for training. And and I'll give him some examples of what we expect him to do beforehand. And he's free to play around with that and experiment, but there's a couple of tent poles in there that need to be achieved. I think if we if you tell them what you expect of them and you're very um what's the word not contrite but um if you're very deliberate with that then these lads will just will will do that because they don't want to they don't want to train like a bag of shit and then over time they're free to mold that and customize it a little bit to what they're used to and then when during this this process in, in upstairs like I mentioned before you can start adding things on the on the hop have you tried this have a look at this just tweak this Let's give another. Let's do another. Let's do four reps of these dribbles instead of two, and then they start to form a form a plan of what makes them feel good. And let's just say at the end of the campaign, when you you debriefing with with how they've gone, so often the lads have gone. I felt I felt really good here. I want to keep this warm up up when I go back to where I'm going back to. That didn't really work for me. The debrief process is really 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 important, not just at the end of a campaign, but with some lads you might debrief fairly regularly, and maybe even every day on the main days or at the end of each week at least who, who brought that in tom was that just a the natural debrief evolution process. the debriefs yeah yeah we've had a lot of consultations with um some of the experts in the services over the years and obviously debriefing is super important there it's life and death but debrief process for us allows us to take things out like a lot of what i've mentioned here today is about putting things in isn't it we're really conscious about removing things that are inhibit or just overwhelm the day so it came about through the need to take things out and understanding what we should take out and in that process we kind of illuminated to us what the what the really important things were we've had consultants over the years who've come in with really amazing deep debrief processes and um we've been influenced by them we we're not in camp every every day they're at the clubs for two-thirds of the year we don't have time to make mistakes learn on the hop and then just leave it till next time. And it's, it's my nature anyway to be like that. So I, we have a, we, we do have a, like a hot debrief and a cold debrief process. And the layers of that, like I said, are more specific to the individual and anyone that's a case study. Like Des Ryan influenced me on that. He's been on your podcast and I've spoken to him about it. And he's got a great debrief process. I use one, I actually use one of his formats, the review process. And um, Dan Pfaff as well has got an amazing debrief process. Again, multi-layered, you can be as condensed or detailed as you need to be. We've mentioned the weight room a little bit. Let's let's go back there. So what's your weight room philosophy when it comes to developing speed? It's, it, it is, <clears throat> I'm, I'm fairly academic with it, but I'm trying to be as pragmatic with it as possible. I'm, it's, it needs to be evidence-based for me. And so we we learned from a lot of the um the, the strength scientists in the in the world that are really good with that type of objective approach. Michael Johnson at UK Athletics has influenced me quite heavily on on that content. While it is very um, like I said, clinical in its approach, there is room for a bit of experimentation and a little bit of nuance that maybe doesn't have the evidence base yet. That might be I don't know it might be eighty twenty percent 
80% on the things which you, you know work, tried and tested, 20% which might allow for a little bit of room of experimentation. And that will change depending on what type of, you know, what stage of the year we're in. We're not going to do it, you know, four days out from a Grand Slam decider, but there's definitely opportunity for it, you know, if you're not playing or if you've got a bye week or whatnot. It tends to be um, three sort of boxes that that we select we select from. You've got the, the meat and the potatoes stuff, which is the stuff that the lads have been doing all their careers, which you just need for basic qualities that they've probably got an emotional attachment to that we don't want to take away in an international campaign because it could be damaging. So that would be the meat and potatoes, squats, big key lifts, like the, the heavy push-pull, the things that make them feel good, that are a part of their prep that you just don't want to be taken away. And, you know, that they give you some kinetic understanding about what some of their basic qualities are like and they offer you a chance to, to to goal set over time especially if there's any glaring issues with any profiling that we do when the lads come in quite often some of those those meat and potatoes do have a correspondence to what we might be seeing um, in their running kinetics especially in acceleration that's the main rock that, that, that meat and potatoes look like the vegetables for us are kind of those special strength exercises that are linked to whatever we're doing on the field. So I haven't said it before, but we um, we use view motion to create our, our kinograms, which are come through, come via speed solutions. And that, that, that follows that technical model of um, projection, reactivity and switching. And they have a relationship with certain exercises that, that push the needle towards more technical efficiency. So those exercises there, fit into that into the uh, into the weight room philosophy very very importantly and that might be 50 percent of the program in, in, in an international campaign the meat and potatoes are covered but in a sort of an optimal volume a lot of the special exercises are things perhaps they we don't think maybe they they're getting outside of us that we can offer as a way to create something novel it you know they're not really invasive exercises so they do suit that tapering that peaking process if you get into the last stages of a campaign and they're unique in that they're quite individual to what the players' work ons are for their running mechanics. So they feel like they're covering everything. They're covering on the field, they're covering it in the gym, and it's not just a cookie-cutter approach. I'm not saying other people do that, but that's our way of trying to make that quite specific to the stuff we want them to do on the field, which ultimately leads to the game model. That's the second box. And then the third box is is it's the it's the myofascial exercises that Danny Foley mentioned to you on your podcast a few a few weeks ago and I'm really into that at the moment. I think that's a, a big open window for exercise development that's got me quite excited because I think there's something in it. And these are just general big movements that follow that myofascial approach. They target the the myofascial slings or trains, what you know, the Thomas Myers trains if you want to call them that. And they I'm finding some good results for them. Like they're making players they're helping players feel good, which is the main thing. And the approach that we, when we introduced that in the World Cup, we got some really good good benefits from that that actually were quite surprising. They're, it, they're not like silver bullets or anything, but they're just a nice little touch that for some people actually could be quite important. There's some lads that don't need to be putting 250 kilos on their back weekly. There's some lads don't. If they're older, they've got that training age. That third box there, that that's something that we think is a, a bit of an untapped avenue. We had a couple of people on the podcast, Nick Lumley, who I'm sure you'll know, um, Corey Schlesinger, who was in the NBA at the time, moving more down this kind of adaptation led approach, which has led them to utilize more machine based um, exercise selection versus your big kind of core lifts that are just there because they've always been there. What's your, what's your thoughts around that? Have you, do you use machines at all? You know what? I'm no. I mean, okay, yeah. If you, it depends if you're calling pulleys and and uh, like versa pulleys or iso inertial devices machines. We do we use plenty plenty of them. I'm, I'm big into those formats. Actual machines like hammer strength machines or pneumatic things like um, Nautilus type stuff. Then no, we we we've got a Kaiser squat. I quite like. I think it's a good substitute for if you can't do your Olympic lifts because it's you can create a power test there and you can push the dial on, on, on your power max in that. I, I quite like that. I think that's quite idiot proof and you can rip and tear into that. And we got, I got that from Randy Huntington and Joseph Coyne 
who were big into that. And at the time when we were had a relationship with um, British bobsleigh, they did a lot of that as well. But I just think it's a nice plan B, the the Kaiser squat. That's probably the only machines we do. Like I'm, I'm very much into movements that have got quite a freedom of, freedom of expression. So barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, very manoeuvrable weights are kind of it for me. We do have game speed things to discuss, but if it's all right with you, I know we talked about this beforehand, we'll get you back and we'll do a full episode with one of the other staff at England Rugby who's integrated yeah. within this process. Is that all right? Yeah, it's gold, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Well, we'll on that, well, on that Rob. Let's, yeah, let's, let's do it. And I think because of the involvement with the medics, I think it would make sense, like you suggested, that they're involved as well. Because yeah. based on the things that you've said at numerous times, that forms a you know a big part of the program. So to, to get that integration would be would be superb. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I've come to you for fifty minutes. Anyone that wants to dive into <laughs> fifty, not fifteen. Um, so anyone that wants to kind of get to know you and this kind of stuff you've got going on, where's the best place? Um. So Instagram. That's just my name, Tom Thompson. I remember when I first started Twitter, I, uh, I had like a, a university name. I need to change that, but that's at Tommy at Tommy Tomble. I need to be a, a new professional handle there now, don't I? No. Insta- no. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right with that. Bring some personality. I like it. You've got plenty of it. Looks the king of the king of the Wombles, but um, yeah, Twitter X, Instagram. You know, I'm, I love corresponding with people on email. So Tom Tomlinson at Hotmail dot com. If it's training talk or anything in, you know, performance science, I'm, I'm rocket keen. So you could always email me on my domestic email account. Lovely. I appreciate it. Thank you for being so open and so happy to come on and uh, and chat to us about all speed training, testing, wearing philosophy, all the good stuff. Yeah, gold, mate. We loved it. Love talk, talking shop. Thanks, mate. Speak soon. <laughs>